All right, so welcome to episode 10 of Exploring Gnosticism. And here we're going to uh, finish up our look at the Gospel of Philip that we started last week. Uh, remember that the Gospel of Philip is a Valentinian uh, Gospel, and uh, it is dealing primarily with the concept of sacraments. Uh, the Gnostics, of course, recognized that the sacraments used by the Church were essentially meaningless window dressing. Uh, they, they were put there as a way of putting some show into things. Uh, it was there to bring to the, the, the naive and the ignorant something that they could tangibly feel that they were experiencing it. But in reality, of course, according to the Gnostics, uh, true sacraments are going to be found through the transmission of knowledge, uh, through the Gnosis, not through the sacraments as we perceive them. So, the sacraments are important to put us on a path. Reading these Gospels are important to put us on the path. We put, on, put ourselves on that path. We start raising the right questions. We start seeking that knowledge. But in the end, that true knowledge has to be transmitted to us. And so I wanted to uh, share with you another passage here from the Gospel of Philip, um, which says, For it is by a kiss that the perfect conceive and give birth. For this reason we also kiss one another. We receive conception from the grace which is in one another. On the surface, it may simply seem to imply that uh, when we are planning to produce an offspring, uh, when we are aiming towards uh, recreating life, it begins simply with the act of kissing. Uh, and kissing leads from one thing to another, and eventually through the act of copulation, you have a child that is, pres uh, that is conceived. Well, on the surface, it may look like that, but there's actually something much deeper and much more interesting that's taking place here. And that goes back, once again, to this idea of the divine making the divine. We talked in the last episode about how the uh, Virgin Mary, uh, as a divine being, is able, without the act of copulation, to produce another divine being. Right? Uh, we are, even though we don't recognize it or realize it, according to the Gnostic tradition, we are divine beings. Uh, we have to come to learn the things that we've forgotten. Right? There's Plato again <laughs> coming through. There's the Bhagavad Gita again coming through. I had this knowledge at one time, but in being born into this world, I've forgotten it. I need to receive this knowledge once again. Well, how is that knowledge transmitted? The euphemism that is given by the Gnostics is the concept of a kiss. The kiss is the transmission of knowledge, the transmission of wisdom, of experience, of understanding of this higher truth from one person to another. We're going to see actually when we talk about the um, uh, Gospel of Judas next week that a lot of people according to the Gnostic tradition anyway, a lot of people misinterpret the story of Judas and Jesus because they see the, the kiss that Jesus gives to, uh, or that Judas rather gives to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They perceive that as being some type of, of mafia kiss of death, but it's not. According to their tradition, it is a transmission of knowledge from one to the other to say, I know and understand what it is that I have to do. And I am willing to do it even though it's not what I want to do. I'm fulfilling the role. I'm fulfilling my duty in this act. So it's actually a very interesting uh, concept and one that we'll talk about in a lot more detail probably next week when we get into the Gospel of Judas. But for right now, uh, we are still looking at this rather interesting Gospel of Philip and trying to understand the idea of the, uh, the, the sacraments uh, as they are made within the Gnostic tradition. All right. <clears throat> God is a dyer. As the good dyes, which are called true, dissolve, 
which the things called, sorry, let me try that again. God is a dyer. As the goods die, which are called true, dissolve with the things died in them. So it is with those whom God has died. Since this dies are immortal, they become immortal by means of his colors. Now God dips what he dips in water. This is a baptismal analogy, obviously, the idea of dipping or placing someone into the water. And the analogy goes to the concept of dying. Uh, when, when you are dyeing clothing, for example, you have your, your vat of color, and you're going to take the, the article of clothing, you're going to dip it down into the, uh, the, the dye, bring it back up, you're going to do that you know, however many times you need to in order to get the richness of the color that you're looking for. Um, but the dye and the cloth, they mingle together, they become one. And once that happens, they're inseparable, right? Once that dye is in, soaked into it uh, and set into it, you're not going to be able to separate them apart. You're not going to be able to take the, the original article of clothing and the, um, and, and the dye and pull them apart again. It's not going to work that way. Once they are mingled and joined together, it is inseparable. Well, one who has received the resurrection has been metaphorically dipped in the baptismal waters. And once that happens, that person is inseparable from the divine. Right? And so the idea of having that transmission of understanding, dipping into that water physically or metaphysically, uh, metaphorically, uh, we would find that, that that is bringing that person the truth of the resurrection. It's bringing them that, that sense of, of understanding. It's bringing that knowledge to them, and it is making that person divine. And once that divine has occurred, it can't be separated. It can't be shifted apart. And so, in that respect, baptism is important. But again, baptism is not necessarily when a person is taken down to the river and dunked. It's not necessarily when in a church somebody is sprinkling water on their head. Real baptism is the baptism of Gnosis. And it can be transmitted, you know, metaphorically through that act of the kiss that we talked about. But it, it implies bringing that wisdom and that knowledge to the person. The other important sacrament that we need to look at here is that of the Eucharist. And initially, he introduces the idea of the Eucharist very, very traditionally. Um, let's see. He who shall not eat my flesh and drink my blood has not life in him. What is it? His flesh is the Word, and his blood is the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist is another way to explain or to understand truth. The bread and the wine that are received are the Word and the Holy Spirit. So we ingest the divine in order to recognize and become the divine. The idea seems a little strange. Um, I mean, even when, if you look at the, the, the original accounts of the, uh, the Last Supper in the Gospels, uh, many of the disciples didn't quite understand what was going on when Jesus took the bread and said, here, take this, eat this, it's my body. And he took the wine and said, here, this is my blood, drink this. Uh, many of them didn't quite understand it. Many of them were kind of repulsed by the idea of it. What are we doing? We're ingesting our God? What kind of strange pagan ritual is this? But, again, that act is being shown as something metaphysical, something metaphorical, uh, a way in which our language is trying to help us to understand what is taking place. When we look at the bread and the wine, this represents the word. Right? Not the word in the sense of language, but word in the sense of that ultimate reality of Christ. 
right? The Logos, that being that has been here since the beginning of, of all things, uh, that thing that was here before the start of the universe, and that concept of the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that are being transmitted through that act of the Eucharist. So if we ingest the divine, we recognize and become the divine. Right? If we fully and completely embrace this, we take it into ourselves. Now, does that mean literally that a person has to sit down and take the wine and the bread? No. Again, to the simple-minded individual, this act becomes a way of symbolizing it, a way of helping them to comprehend or understand. Uh, but to one who has received the Gnosis, they realize that it was that act of transmission that brought them to knowledge of their divine status, because they have been divine for as long as Christ has been divine, which is to imply forever. So, eating the God is not literally eating it, but rather taking in the knowledge to help you understand that you have always been it. Going along with these lines, let's look at another one a little further on. Um, the world is a corpse eater. All the things eaten in it, in it themselves die also. Truth is a life eater. Therefore, no one nourished by truth will die. It was from that place that Jesus came and brought food. To those who so desired, he gave life, that they may not die. The world is a corpse eater. Truth is a life eater. Odd lines. But we can see a parallel here. If we look at the Vedic text of the Upanishads, uh, there's a passage in the Upanishads which says, O oh, the wonder of joy, I am the food of life, and I am he who eats the food of life. I am the two in one. I am the firstborn in the world of truth, born before the gods, born in the center of immortality. He who gives me is my salvation. I am that food which eats the eater of food. That passage from the Upanishads is very similar uh, and potentially could have influenced the line here in the Gospel of Philip. But the point, again, in both places is that these sacraments allow us to embrace the sacrament of action, of unction, rather, which takes their person to their final glory. Right? Um, the idea of the Eucharist. taking in the divine into the self, transforming that individual, that is the act of, of extreme unction. Um, and in essence, it is the, the, the transmission of that understanding um, in the embodiment of that understanding. And so to symbolically take that in, right, we're doing that act, and that's fine. But to comprehend it, we can't just comprehend it in the sense of, okay, I theoretically understand what's being done. But it has to be embraced through that sense of true knowledge to where, yes, this is the reality. Yes, I embrace this completely. That's when true gnosis shines through. And that's where our true divinity is to be found. But one receives the unction of the, some lines are missing here, um, of the power of the cross. This power the apostles called the right and the left. For this person is no longer Christian, but a Christ. No longer Christian, but a Christ. When the Orthodox makes this claim, he traces the movement from Christianity to Christ. But in the Gnostic tradition, the movement from Christian to Christ is not the story of one man, 
but it is the ultimate story of everyone. When we, receive, uh, when we revisit uh, Elaine Poggle's comments, particularly the statement, when man knows himself in God, who is over truth, he will be saved. Now we can grasp the true meaning of what that implies. Now we can understand the reality of what's being presented there. To one who has received the resurrection, the sacraments are merely window dressing. The sacraments belong to this world, the realm of relative or lower truths. <clears throat> and when one is transcended to the real truth, these lower truths are irrelevant. They simply disappear. <clears throat> So we're back to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> so we're back to Nagarjuna again. Nagarjuna, remember, in the second century taught us about the higher truths and the lower truths of understanding, and how once we embrace the higher truths of sunyata, that the lower truths would simply disappear, would no longer be an issue. And so I seek those higher truths, um, through my experience. And once I possess them, then I realize that the lower level truths, all of the dichotomies of the world, simply disappear. They serve no purpose any longer. Uh, as Nagarjuna stated, even distinctions like samsara and nirvana would disappear completely. Right? Samsara, of course, the world that we live in, uh, the changing, fleeting world of appearance. And um, Nirvana being that state that we hope to attain of, of perfect contentment and peace. Um, <clears throat> in actuality, Nirvana is described by many as an, an escape into non-existence, a ceasing to be. But in that ceasing to be, all suffering and misery of this material world would stop. But there again, Nagarjuna's words are showing us that to the simple-minded, to the uninitiated, there's this promise of escaping from the pains and suffering of this world that's very important to us. But there's something more to the one who understands the higher truth. They understand that these are simply ways of helping us to explain the world, and so they disappear. Right? If I'm talking to someone and I'm saying, look, why should you follow the Eightfold Path? Why should you follow the Four Noble Truths? Why should you get on these paths? I have to be able to show that person something that they can receive. And so I can show them the misery and the suffering of the world that they're in. And I can show them the beauty of Nirvana. But to one who climbs on that path, to one who follows it, to the point that they begin to realize the higher truth, that they let go of all of those things that are, that are keeping them attached to this world. To that person who has embraced and experienced sunyata, the distinction between nirvana and samsara disappear completely. None of the dichotomies exist. Life and death, male and female, light and dark, nirvana and samsara. They disappear completely because they're not real. They never were. They were a tool that we were using to help the uninitiated understand, to put them on the path. But once they come to the realization, they understand the true reality, which is a unity of all things in its own way. To the Buddhist, it's the unity that comes through emptiness, through non-existence. Um, but we can see a parallel to that right here in what's being said in the Gospel of Philip. These sacraments are like that Eightfold Path, like, that four no like those Four Noble Truths. It is a path that we can get on. It's something that we can use to help people to understand. And so we start talking about the distinction between heaven and earth. Well, that dichotomy, too, is really just like the dichotomy of um, nirvana and samsara. It's the world that we live in, the world of pain, of suffering, of misery, of agony. Uh, and it is heaven, which is that blissful, wonderful place that we seek to, 
desire to be in. And so we see the distinction between them. And so that brings people to the desire to escape from this world and to find their, their place in the, the divine. And that's great. That's the purpose of the sacrament. It's to help them on that path. But when they reach that higher level, once gnosis has been attained, then that person will realize that heaven and earth are one and the same. Life and death are one and the same. Male and female are one and the same. They will come to recognize that unity that is found within all things. So, to one who is yet to receive the resurrection, these sacraments are tools to understanding. The sacraments are important because they move us towards this gnosis, but they should not be seen as an end in and of themselves as they are in the Orthodox tradition. They need to be recognized for what they truly are. Right? So there is a purpose to baptism. There is a purpose to the Eucharist. There is a purpose to each of these sacraments. But it's not for their own sake. It's simply to put us on the path to where we can attain that gnosis and receive true liberation, which comes through that knowledge again that God, Christ, and man are the same. The unity. It comes from the reality that the kingdom of heaven that we're seeking, we already live there. It's already present. We just have to realize it through that transformed state of consciousness. We have to let go of the world that we're living in. Let go of the attachments and the allure of this world and instead embrace that other existence. Embrace that higher truth and let go of the lower levels. And that's the key. And that's what the Gospel of Philip is going to uh, show us. Okay. So that's what I've got to say with regards to the Gospel of Philip uh, for today. So Hopefully, over the last two uh, episodes, you've learned a lot about these uh, concepts. Of course, as always, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to uh, write them below, and I'll be happy to uh, respond to you on those. Next week, uh, we are going to move on to look at our final uh, gospel that we're going to look at, the Gospel of Judas. And uh, it's a very unique, a very interesting uh, piece. <clears throat> And it has a local connection for many of you uh, to Kent State University. So we'll talk a little bit about that and um, what exactly that connection is in our next episode. <laughs>